Our presenters today will be Gus Chikala, the founder and CEO of Project Assistance, and Jim Colton, the Practice Director of Portfolio and Project Management. I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Uh, it will be Jim Colton, who is the Practice Director, as I said. He also was CEO of a project management consulting firm for many years. I'll take it away, Jim. Jim's going to pass it to Gus. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> so uh, our agenda today is uh, we're going to talk about leadership roles and context. We're going to talk about the difference between leading a project and supporting a project. And uh, a few slides on that, uh, which is really the background of our presentation today. Uh, once we get through the background, we're going to talk about some of the challenges with staffing project managers uh, onto a project. Uh, from there, we'll address some of the best uh, best practices. And um, once we get through the best practices, we'll talk a little bit about how we approach this and get some questions. Uh, we're going to ask you a few questions to keep you interactive and, uh, and show you some of those results as well. So uh, to start, when we talk about these leadership uh, roles and context, what we really want to think about is, is how leadership uh, is different than technical execution. So uh, when we look at this world of project and portfolio management, you know, at, at the top of the pyramid, we have this idea <coughs> uh, around portfolio management from a strategy standpoint. What are the right projects? And, and once we answer the question by selecting a slate of projects uh, for the portfolio, we come to the, to the second and third tier you see on your screen, which is the execution leadership and the technical execution. And so uh, today we want to talk about, from a leadership standpoint, what we mean by being successful at defining, executing, and finishing a project. And from that standpoint, this question of what do we mean by success? And the typical, the most common definition of a successful project would be on time, on budget, and on spec. And, and so we talk about this right-hand side, this project management side, as, as, a, uh, as a set of business controls. And, and so really for today, we're going we're to talk about how project management uh, goes across many of these disciplines. So the on-spec side, the left-hand side of the, of, the, of the pyramid, talks about delivering our projects, our deliverables on spec. Okay. Um, however, across the top of this, we see project management, the business controls. So our, our focus today is really going to be on how we think about differently uh, the, 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 the really two methodologies to need to act in unison for a project to produce its deliverables. We've got the on-time, on-budget methodology of project management, and then we've got the technical execution. We see some examples here around product development, IT methods, architectural engineering design, aerospace and defense, and corporate initiatives. And uh, you know, even from a, from a corporate initiative standpoint, um, oftentimes, these are the things that really drive the large capital projects at the highest level of the organization, the mergers and acquisitions, and something, we'll, and something we talk about, which is the organizational change management. How do you get better at project management, for example? So let's take an example. When we go through these, what I call application areas, or these, these uh, uh, methodologies of how we deliver our deliverables, here's an example we want to talk about today, which is uh, project management for, uh, for information technology. So when we look at uh, the roles, the leadership roles, on the left side of the ledger, when we think about the methodology, the IT methods, whether it's ITIL, whether it's agile, whether it's uh, waterfall, systems development life cycle, uh, something around uh, infrastructure, networks, hardware, uh, regardless of those methods, when we think about the leadership roles, the business controls, we think about program managers, project managers, schedulers, project administrators. On the methodology leadership side, we look at business analysts, we look at DBA, solution architects. But what we're going to focus on today from an information technology standpoint in this webinar is the staffing of the project leadership for information technology. 
The other thing we're going to talk about on the next slide is this idea of life sciences product development or product development in general, right? So when, when we when we look into life sciences uh, leadership, we see similar roles to IT but somewhat different. We're going to be running clinical trials, for example. So we've got clinical trials managers. We've got uh, again, program managers, project managers, schedulers, and project administrators uh, from an R&D methodology, from a drug development, bioscience development standpoint, we see the leaders around clinical research, analysis, uh, uh, even outsourcing clinical research operations, uh, uh, study directors, medical affairs directors, those kinds of things. But again, for today, we want to just really focus on the best practices for these leadership roles. And oh, by the way, at the bottom of the pyramid, we have these execution capabilities, right? So we acknowledge in the world of staffing that uh, oftentimes, especially from an IT standpoint, uh, that, that these roles come from what I would call traditional technical staffing agencies. And we're going to talk about those differences today. So, so why would we use outside project managers? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, uh, capital spend on projects has returned, right? Uh, eight years ago, seven years ago, when the when the global financial meltdown occurred, uh, you know, one one of our business lines is installing Microsoft Project Server. Well, it was pretty hard to have a discussion with a company to say, "Would you like a tool to automate your projects?" and have them say, "We're not doing any projects." Okay, so so that has changed, right? We we see the capital spend has returned. But this, this term I hate, and it's true, I'm, I'm afraid, at some level, this jobless uh, recovery from the recession, you know, that the headcount hasn't come back yet. And so we see a lot of PMOs struggling with um, either, either their, uh, the funding's there for the project, but they can't get the headcount. They've got, you know, 20 projects and 10 project managers, and how do we, how do we find uh, the additional talent? So that's one reason we see outside project managers go, go there. Um, and, you know, they're forced to go outside for a critical role for something that traditionally we want to have inside. There are challenges by bringing outsiders. There's questions of culture. There's questions of authority. Let's face it, there's always questions of authority. Wouldn't you say, Jim, with, with project managers? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, we're, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to talk about some of these issues today. And then, and then the other one we talk about, besides being forced to go outside, is the uh, is the idea of uh, internal staff uh, not available, right? So the peaks and the valleys. Uh, we, you know, the the ebbs and flow of projects uh, doesn't uh, obviously match to the amount of capacity that's in the project management role. You know, we do a uh, uh, quick side note. We do a, a leadership uh, training course uh, about predictable points of resistance. What makes projects fail? And one of the things we see there is that um, especially the, the, what I call the predictable points of resistance execution is the lack of availability of bandwidth of project managers to really establish and maintain control of the project. So the PMOs that, that get that uh, won't stand for giving three, four, five projects to their limited project management staff, but in fact will recognize that taking some of that capital spend from the project budget could go to some outside help to really relieve some of those peaks of demand we see in the project management world. So having said that, there are challenges. Um, uh, you know, we live in a world of trade-offs, or what, what I, the question I like to ask is, what color is project management? And the answer is gray. And, uh, and there's these gray areas we have to operate in. Yes, we do, not, do have to go outside sometimes to get that help, but let's talk about some of the challenges that occur in that world. And, um, we're going to talk about some of these challenges, but let's get you involved as early as we can. So our first poll here today is to ask a question, which you should see on your screen. So if you'll, have, you'll take a couple minutes uh, if you select uh, your biggest challenge. And then we'll go ahead and show a scatter diagram here, a bar chart that will uh, see what kind of responses we're getting. Wow. What do you think, Jim? Is that what you expected? 
That that is what I expected. The budget challenge. So yeah. how do we how do we show it to everybody? Sharing poll results. Yep. So I'll let you all think about that while we're thinking about what this means. I, I've got an interpretation of 50%. Wow, that's a big number. What, what, how do you read that, Jim? I read that a lot of companies want to bring in a senior PM or program manager but aren't willing to pay the senior PM or program manager rate. And that, that presents real challenges, I think, internally for, for delivery. Yeah, and it's just... Um, you know, I, I had the same thought. I, you know, this word commodity comes to mind, and I, and I presume we have some sympathizers on the phone today uh, to this problem, right? I mean, I, I'm sure we have folks on here that are working in PMOs that would like to have larger budgets or maybe uh, maybe a better uh, source of, of talent that you might be able to, to go after, but, you know, at some point you get what you pay for. So clearly that's a challenge in this market. You know, it was, there was a time... Uh, eight years ago where uh, we couldn't get, uh, so sometimes we hire um, some contractors, hire guns, people, people that are serial contractors that want to be contractors. There's a lot of people out there contractors against their will because they can't find full-time employment, but there's folks out here that, that, that want to do this on a regular basis, and there was a time uh, you couldn't hire a contractor project manager for less than $100 an hour. That's what we were paying. Uh, you know, so so when you take that back to the company, uh, those rates uh, got pretty high, and you know these folks have come down, and, and they've been forced to come down. Uh, but you still get that uh, the rate where um, it's still lower than what the market bears. Let's face it, and you do get what you pay for. Unfortunately, we'll we'll talk about that a little later. Okay. So the challenges, uh, unrealistic timeline. So. Uh, one of the things we see is, um, you know, planning takes longer than expected. You know, whether we're onboarding a new vendor, um, uh, whether whether we're trying to hire somebody in a week or two, but we've got you know the best people out there uh, have a conscience and they're working. You know, so they might need <laughs> two or three weeks notice. Um, it takes time. Um, you know, the best people aren't always available, so you know, it's uh, taking a little bit longer. Sometimes it uh, does yield better folks um, internally, right? We, we, you know, on, on your side of the fence, if you're trying to bring an outside project manager in, you've got a hiring manager that, that's busy. Uh, uh, the people we're trying to schedule are busy. Uh, you know, th there's there's all kinds of um, barriers to understanding what's realistic from a time standpoint. You know, really, what is realistic, and, and how do we get that right? Uh, the other the other challenge we see is the, re the requirements are unclear. You know, it's, some of this uh, we've learned how to work with this. You know, in terms of um, a couple things. You know, you get the whisper down the lane where a hiring manager talks to an HR person, and an HR person talks to a PMO person, and by the time we get it, um, it's not quite what we're looking for. The other thing is um, sometimes the capabilities evolve as our customers talk to our candidates. You know, we thought we wanted A, and we met A, and now that we met A, we think we want B, right? So, so uh, and then, you know, there, there's a cycle on that. Sometimes we go through a batch of candidates that, that are a bullseye on the requirements or something close to a bullseye, and then we find out the target moved, and uh, that creates its own set of challenges. Um, so, so that's, that's, that's a big one, right? Uh, getting, getting these things nailed down and, and making who's available against what's optimal. This uh, this challenge around hiring technical talent versus um, leadership talent. You know the uh, uh, you know it used to I couldn't articulate a couple of years ago what my issue was with PMP, but I finally have come to a, uh, something I can I think I can articulate. PMP is great. I think it's awesome. But what it does is it tells us what the technical skills are of a project manager. Can you build a charter? What's in the status report? What does execution look like? What's the controlling cycle look like? And, and, and at the end of the day, the question is, can you apply it, right? And, and application is, is everything. And, and so I've come to the conclusion, and we as a company have come to the conclusion that, you know, it's really a lot about the, the, the soft skills, what we call GIPS and GALT, G-I-P-S, G-A-W-E, good interpersonal skills, gets along with everyone, right? So, so I view 
the technical side as, as, as the uh, price of admission, right? And, and, and beyond that, um, you know, how do you, how do you really test leadership? How do you test interpersonal skills? How do you test a project manager that has, uh, uh, can give you real stories that, 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 that they've, they've managed a project where it went off the rails and they got it back on the rails doing what I call facing the predictable points of resistance. Right? A lot of people, and you project managers out there know this, there's a lot of folks out there in the business world that don't understand why we need adult supervision for adults. Right? And, and that's kind of the field that we're in. Right? And, 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 it, 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 and it's a very tactful role to have responsibility without authority and to, and to, and to try to be a leader uh, in a place where people don't necessarily think they even need you in, in some cases. So that's, that's a tough one. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, so over emphasis on skills versus results, and, and Jim's going to get into that a little deeper in terms of defining, you know, what are we really looking for? You know, how do we really measure these folks against uh, a set of goals instead of a set of skills, or what skills actually are needed to meet those goals? Uh, process gaps, you know, client and staffing uh, partners, uh, you know, there, there's gaps on both sides, and uh, Jim's going to go through a best practice to drill into that a little deeper, so I'm not going to steal some there. Uh, staffing is a commodity. You know, my, my definition of a commodity is uh, something that's easily replaced. Something, a, a source of supply is easily replaced. We bought this brand of paper plates for the picnic last time, and it didn't work. And now we're going to buy another brand, and it doesn't really hurt to switch. Uh, you know, staffing is treated like a commodity. I know a lot of you know this from your, your procurement departments, and the way they they bring in uh, managed vendors, and the way they they bid uh, down prices. And at the end of the day. It's not easy to swap people out, and you know that. You know, you get them on board. They got to get laptops. They got to get security. They've got to get badges. They've got to get space. But more importantly, you spend your valuable time and their valuable time getting them up to speed. If they don't work out, that's very costly. And 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 uh, and we don't have the time to treat. Uh, most of us don't have the time to treat staffing as a commodity. So that's a real challenge. And uh, and then of course, the, you know, the associated cost with that. Uh, and, and the time is a big one. It's a really big one. So uh, I took 21 minutes of my 20 minutes, so hopefully I'm okay here, Jim. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Yeah, so I'll, I'll adjust my uh, scope accordingly oh, to pull my time frame in. Great project manager. <laughs> All right, I'm going to launch with a, uh, the next polling question. If you could take a look. I'm getting the last poll for some other. Which part of the staffing process does your organization struggle with the most? Is it in terms of defining the requirement, the initial screening of the candidate, and is it the interviewing process, onboarding, or really effectively applying the talent within your organization? Give you a moment to uh, provide an answer. Wow, this is like the uh, Clinton Sanders the other night. You want to flip a coin here? <laughs> it, it's tight. Well, we got two. We got a tie for a second. Oh, oh somebody just waited. Look at that. A couple precincts still coming in. Yeah, All right. Uh, why don't we, uh, if we can share that. Interesting. So we, you can see the, the results there in front of you. Uh, I expected actually defining the requirement to come out on top. It was right there kind of in a number two. Uh, you know, kind of what we see as a best practice. Uh, we've been in this business for 20 years, Gus. Uh, I'll get to 20 years, yeah. Uh, 
So we've, we've learned a lot along the way. We've made some mistakes, uh, hopefully learned from most of those mistakes and, and have learned to apply uh, you know, kind of our lessons learned to improve uh, the staffing process. So in terms of the steps, uh, step number one is really that communication of the, of the overall process, getting, getting both the uh, client and the staffing provider in unison and defining the requirements uh, for that position. Uh, initiation, initiating the search, step two, uh, review, compare, select for follow-up. So that filtering or screening process, again, you know, how do I go from that long list to a short list of potential candidates? Uh, preparing for the candidate interview, actually conducting the interview or interviews, plural, uh, selecting the right candidate, and the post-decision process, that, that would include the onboarding. So we're just going to walk through just some things that we've learned, again, over, over the years. Um, so some tips and techniques. So first and foremost, uh, really getting a clear understanding of the requirement. And Gus talked about you know, focusing on the results versus skills. So if you, if you t look, look at it from a more strategic uh, perspective. What's the end game that you're trying to accomplish? Is it rolling out a new product, implementing a new solution, uh, implementing a new process? I think each uh, each project is unique by definition. So I think in terms of the project manager or program manager or the, any other uh, skill around project management, you're going to have unique needs each and every time. So it, it's not um, like you want to take the job description off the shelf and send it out to the staffing provider as your requirement. It's, that's a good start. But you really need to tailor, uh, we would suggest tailoring your needs, your requirements, based on the unique project that you're looking to hire for or projects. Uh, understanding what's really needed. Uh, Gus touched on that. Uh, and we're finding more and more that, uh, especially as you get into these more senior project management or program management roles, it, it's more heavily weighted in terms of competencies and leadership than really the technical skills. You know, Gus talked about the, the technical skills as kind of the price of admission. And then, you know, really delving into the leadership talent, identifying those competencies, um, especially as you get into managing things like large programs that are enterprise-wide. Uh, defining the plan timeline. Um, you know, normally this process takes longer than you'd expect, um, especially if you, you know, your, your end game is really to find the, the right fit. Um, so we would suggest as project management uh, consultants, you know, put a timeline together, put a project plan. What are the key activities? If you don't have a, a, a current process, we recommend, you know, defining a process at least at a high level. So, you know, people get comfortable with the steps along the way, who's responsible for what, and you know what's the essential uh, what's the essential timeline and timing of each activity? Uh, ensuring that internal constituents are on board. So I, I've I've seen this many many times. Uh, you've got the hiring manager that uh, you know goes to HR, requests a new position, but the, you know the budget isn't quite there yet. You know they're still working with finance to get the budget. So the process starts. And then you realize that uh, you don't have the budget. You know, it's kind of a false start and a waste of time. So you really kind of need to make sure that all participating parties, uh, you know, you've got the budget, you've got HR, uh, human resources uh, folks on board, you've got your project interview team uh, prepared, uh, make sure that they have time carved out to conduct the interviews and provide feedback. And really the stakeholder, uh, you know, the sponsor of this uh, request has the bandwidth and is prepared to uh, move ahead. Gus mentioned briefly, you know, use results to define the required skills. So I think that you're going to find, depending on the type of project, the, the skills are going to vary pretty dramatically. We, we talked about if you're looking for a program manager, uh, probably 80% of the competencies or skills that you desire are really on the soft side, on the leadership side, versus potentially you know, a migration, an application, 
from one version to another. You may want something that someone that's more technical. Uh, the soft skills probably aren't as broadly uh, needed or required. So really think about the end game and from the end game start to think about the specific skills for the role. Step two, initiating the search. Uh, decide how, how to best fill the needs. So it may be that uh, you decide to go internal. Uh, you could look at other, other uh, business units within the, uh, the company to fill a need. You could decide to go external, but uh, do the recruiting yourself. You know, today we're kind of more focused on you're going external, you're going to use a staffing provider. And then it's really a matter of which staffing provider or providers do you want to put the requisition out to. Because I think, again, uh, different staffing providers will have certain uh, expertise and niches that they uh, they fill within. Uh, so we just you know mentioned selecting the appropriate vendor. Uh, again, I think there's a wide range of staffing providers out there, as you're probably familiar with, and they have various strengths um, depending on the you know the company, their background and experience, and where their focus is. Uh, communicate the requirements with the staffing partners clearly. So I couldn't uh, emphasize this enough. You know, uh, how do you clearly articulate those requirements? Again, I don't think it's grabbing a job description off the shelf. It, it's really looking at the end game, identifying those specific competencies, competencies and skills, uh, trying to understand you know are soft skills more important, leadership skills. Uh, are you really looking at more technical skills for this specific type of, type of project? And then you want to start to gather the resumes. Uh, we'll talk about uh, you know, resume gathering here in the next step in more detail. In terms of providing the requirements, this is just an example of you know, kind of a format that we might use uh, and some of the key attributes that you're looking to identify for the potential hire. So certainly uh, the position description, the responsibilities that they're going to have, what, what type of level? Do you need junior, senior, executive level? Are you looking for a contract, uh, attempt to perm, or a permanent hire? Things around start dates, end dates, hourly rates. I think you can probably kind of read through some of this stuff. Most importantly, what are those core skills or competencies? You know, kind of the must-haves versus the nice-to-haves. Uh, if you got the position description, you know, all, that's always a good reference as a generic. Uh, who's the primary contact, both the hiring manager and the recruiter? Uh, certainly, contact information is key. And and the rest of the contact information. So just an example of a you know, pretty in-depth requirements form. And again, you want to spend a significant amount of time or enough time to adequately and completely and thoroughly document the requirements. So work with the hiring managers or work with the HR group, depending on who you are. Uh, talk to your stakeholder. Talk to your sponsor. Uh, get, you know, get everyone's input because you don't want to false start. False starts um, are costly in terms of time, and if you don't have the right requirements, you know, ultimately you may up with you may end up with the wrong the wrong candidates and the wrong the wrong project manager. In terms of step three, review, compare, select for follow up. So let's talk about screening the resumes. Um, again, let's focus on results. If, if you're looking at a resume that's showing a bunch of technical uh, certifications and qualifications, and very little in terms of, you know, improving the, the uh, improving performance, reducing costs, uh, generating revenue. Uh, I think those are the things, results-oriented resumes that you're looking for not a list of technical skills or a list of certifications. You, know, you want to hire the individual that's been there, done it, and done it well. We talk about this um, 
you know, gap analysis. So I think the more that you can kind of quantify the skills, document the skills, quantify them, you may even go to the point where you have uh, different weightings for the different competencies. Uh, use a spreadsheet. So, you know, list the requirements or the skills, competencies that you're looking for. Uh, maybe apply a weight to each one. Uh, you know, kind of make it a little bit more quantitative and take out the guesswork. Uh, get, get people to agree on which skills are most important. Uh, and then have it, you know, have a nice game plan to move forward. Uh, you want to be real crisp with scheduling, running, interview, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, time, time is costly. The, the best candidates uh, that are available don't last long in the marketplace. So the great candidate that's out there today, you know, may not be there tomorrow. So time is of the essence. Uh, time is also in the essence in terms of, you know, getting the project kicked off in a timely fashion. If you start the project, you know, two to four weeks to six weeks late, because you can't find the right candidate, uh, you know, you're potentially uh, biting into your return on investment for that project. Again, we, we, you know, we're stressing focus on results first and then identify the skills and competencies needed. Use that scoring model. Uh, it, it also gives you a way to compare candidates. You know, it, it's, it doesn't come down to, you know, I like Billy a lot, but Susie was, was okay. You know, that's, <laughs> those are judgments that are hard to, to compare and contrast. So if you get people to think about, you know, the competencies, agree on them, and then start to quantify and come up with, uh, you know, specific numbers is, is ideal. Use a scoring model. Highly recommended. It also takes, you know, it takes the bias uh, out of your decision making. Uh, so then you want to, you know, once you have a long list, you want to fine tune the requirements. You may get a few resumes in where, you know, there's no one that's an exact fit. Uh, more, more often than not, you're not going to find the perfect uh, person for a position. But obviously, you want to get as close as possible. So once you get the initial uh, resume batch, you may want to revisit, uh, revisit your requirements and your scoring model. Uh, we strongly suggest, you know, this is a people game, so you know, have some respect for the candidates um, and your and your providers in terms of the overall process. Um, you know, Gus mentioned, you know, people are not a commodity, so it, it's it's good for you uh, to respect the candidates, and it's you know, it's great for the candidates. You know, one of, one of the things I say to our candidates <coughs> is um, what I think makes us different than some staffing uh, businesses is that we're the third ones to get happy, right? In other words, you know, a lot of staffing firms appropriately, appropriately focus on the on the clients, and some of you probably are potential clients or maybe current clients. I don't know, but yeah, you're important, but the candidate's important too. I think it's kind of an equal game, right? The, the best people go to the best companies, and if you're not acting like one, you're not going to get them. And but but from our perspective, it's you know, how do we? How do we really respect that candidate and make sure this is good for them? You know, they they say, well, what's the culture like? So, well, don't you know? Let's find out because you better like it, or we're not going to try to put you in there. Just an example. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, great point about the culture. I mean, we can't emphasize culture enough. Is the culture the right fit? Because that's going to tie in the results. If um, you know, you've got a type A off the chart personality, and you're trying to put that person into a more, um, let's call it type B, um, culture, it, even though that person's had great results in other environments, they may not be successful in a type B environment. So it's important to have a match um, in terms of culture and environment. Yeah, we had a great bulldog we wanted to put into an account, and it was at a university. Boy, did that fail. Huh? <laughs> this person, not, you brought a corporate PM in here, and they're not, not going to work here. So, Absolutely. Okay, uh, preparing for the uh, interview. Uh, here we go back to the skills versus results matrix. So we want to use that skill competency definition to really drive the interview questions. We shouldn't have an interview questionnaire that's one size fits all. So again, based on the specific projects uh, that you're looking to hire for, that should drive the results that you're looking for, which should drive the skills and competencies, 
which drive the interview questions. So it's kind of a domino effect. Uh, give the candidate scoring tools. So each each time you prepare it, you may have to tweak it. Again, depending on the type of project, the type of competencies, and type of skills. Um, make sure you have assigned roles for all involved internal parties. So you know people know exactly what the responsibilities are. You may have one person uh, in interviewing or probing for the uh, soft skills. Someone else, you know, looking at and assessing the technical skills, and someone else focused on uh, cultural fit. So it's important that everyone knows their, you know, kind of role and responsibility. Uh, set the stage before asking questions. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, you know, uh, make sure that uh, you're prepared to have the candidate be at ease and be comfortable. Uh, uh, have have your uh, conference rooms ready wherever you're doing, uh, conducting the interviews. Uh, make sure you're well synced with uh, the administrative staff, whoever's you know maybe escorting that individual into the building. Just to, you know, kind of make sure that the process is is tight from start to finish, because I think um, even one misstep in the process flow could send a bad you know kind of a red flag out to the candidate. And we, you know, we're, we're saying it here probably for the fifth time so far, but you know, focus on the success-based interview. So we want to have people in our in our environment that have achieved results. They have the competencies and skills that that are going to put them in a great position uh, to be successful within your organization. In terms of conducting the interview, again, on you know. As much as you can, stress examples. Uh, have a candidate walk through difficult situations uh, where they've, you know, turned projects around, or where have they struggled with a, uh, you know, a, a stakeholder, a team member on the project. How, how have they work through uh, difficult situations. Um, you know, see if they've actually been there and you know experienced those kind of behavioral challenges and how did they overcome them. I think that'll give you some great insight into the candidate's uh, skill set and, and personality. Um, really explore you know, the, those essential areas of where you think the, the candidate must be, must be good or must, must have certain strengths. Uh, force yourself to postpone biases. So try to get beyond first impressions and really focus on you know, what's going to make this person succeed within my company. You know, focus on execution. Uh, we we uh, advocate. It says phone screen here, but uh, even better is a you know video slash phone where you know you can actually uh, look the person in the face, uh, get their reactions to some of your questions. Um, you know, see the responses. Of, I know you knows the answer to this. What percentage of uh, communication is, is nonverbal versus verbal? It's more than half. Yeah. I mean, neuro-linguistic programming says the words are something less than 10%. The tone is probably about a third, and, and the rest of it's body language. And uh, you know, if you're not seeing somebody, uh, you're not getting more than half the communication. Yeah, and the other thing with the phone screen is, you, you know, you don't know if... Uh, you know, the candidate has a cheat sheet there that he, he's just kind of rattling off. Uh, and it might have the mom sitting there feeding the answers, right? <laughs> yeah, you don't know what's going on. So uh, <laughs> recommend, a, you know, a WebEx go to meeting, use your video, phone screens. I had a, I had a guy melt down because uh, he couldn't get his Skype go. Um, I didn't think he was going to make a very good project manager. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, uh, the five for did not sit, submit him, by the way. <laughs> Uh, evaluate the five predictors. So, and I don't know who to give credit for this, um, but some of the predictors are adaptability uh, to your environment. You know, uh, does that, this person fit into our culture? Certainly, past success in similar types of projects. Uh, does this person have leadership capabilities? Again, um, you know, try to get them to cite examples of where they've been a leader and how. It, it may be difficult to interview, but but try to pull that out. Uh, have they executed successfully? Do you see results on their resume and can they uh, verbally communicate 
you know, what they've achieved in terms of business results. And you know, did he have an initiative? I, I think that one's uh, pretty easy to to assess. But you know, is this that person that's going to be excited about coming to work for you? All right, two more two more areas I'm going to cut, go through, and then I'm going to hand it back to Gus. So selecting the right candidate. Um, Again, try to be objective. Let's get away from, you know, I really like Billy, or I really thought Tommy um, might not be great here. You know, what are those reasons why? If you get it down into a quantitative assessment with specific competencies and skills uh, being evaluated, I think you're going to have a better end result. You know, I find myself, Jim, uh, fighting my first impressions. Mm -hmm. I, I, I jump to conclusions, and, I, and what I've learned is when, when I listen longer, and jump away from those conclusions, uh, I'm able to keep an open mind and, and actually uh, find that some of these candidates are better than I first uh, thought. And so holding judgment uh, has been very helpful to me. Yeah. Yeah, same here. Uh, make sure you have good coordination among all the parties so you can gather feedback in a timely fashion. Uh, time is of the essence. I uh, can't stress it enough. Uh, the, the best candidates don't last long. If you see the right candidate, you know, kind of move quickly. Uh, most of these other uh, points under select the right candidate, you know, pretty much already talked about. Uh, make sure you get adequate feedback. Uh, you may want to regroup as a team, especially if it's a, you know a really key position. You know, talk it through pros and cons. You may have. Uh, a virtual tie in terms of the quantitative scores, so uh, then you might want to talk through, you know, more in depth in terms of the differentiators between the two candidates. Uh, do a thorough reference check. You know, what comes to my mind on that. Um, anybody, almost anybody. I, I, there's some rare exceptions. Can produce somebody that says, "Susie does a nice job." What I have found is when you get a great candidate. People go above and beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, they they're 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 gushing. They're glowing. They're 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 keeping you on the phone. They're. Uh, yeah. I've said to people, uh, I think you might be making a mistake if you don't hire Jim. Yeah. You know. So I, I think I, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, that's what you want to hear. Knock the ball out of the park with the reckless. Provide feedback. You know, everyone involved. So that's that's the candidate, the staffing providers, your internal team. In terms of post decision process, you know, again, speed is of the essence. You, you want to get the project started on time. Uh, you want to move quickly. You know, hopefully, you have a documented process you can move through. Um, get the person onboarded. Um, get them productive quickly. You know, get them any any background materials they need on the projects. Um, if there's any uh, you know SOPs they need to read. Uh, you know, get them up to speed, get them moving, put them in a position to be successful quickly, because they are going to be judged. Um, I think in, a, in an expedited fashion. I'm going to, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Gus. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate that. And I was three minutes over, I think. Sorry. Well, I'm not sure I need the other 17 minutes. So it's probably <laughs> good that you did that. So we have a uh, we have a poll. So where do your staffing providers need the most improvement? Pricing, speed, availability of talent, skills mismatch. Pick the one that you think is the uh, the highest area that, that where improvement is required. Folks are getting the hang of the, the polling questions. I think they're answering very rapidly. I like the I like the answers. It's not what I expected. Huh. The fourth place I thought might be close to the top. It's interesting. It's encouraging. Yeah, that is. So it shows maturity. Yeah. I think you can show it, Dan. So we've got availability of talent. 
that's uh, that's really interesting. You know, we got almost everybody we talk to is unemployed. You know, there's a lot of people. A lot of, there appears to be a lot of good people out there, but I, I would agree. You know, it's finding the right people is, is still tricky. Um, if you're getting picky, it's getting tricky. <laughs> And speed is right there at number two. Yeah. So I just spent a couple of minutes on some solution differentiators. So traditional staffing companies, um, we talked about this a little bit. Um, when I say traditional staffing companies, I, I mean ones that focus primarily on the technical skills, right? So um, I'm going to talk about the downside of this a little bit, right? Um, a lot of times it's a high volume of resumes. Um, puts a lot of work on, on you if, if you're a hiring manager. Um, uh, the internal uh, reviews are not rigorous. Uh, you know, I, some of you have probably seen the worst case scenarios. You know, uh, a resume bill uh, sort of cranks out a resume without even talking to the candidate. I mean, we've had the embarrassment of submitting a candidate and having this person not even know they were submitted by somebody else. Um, you know, you get to pick the best of the worst. Right, uh, so you know we we have uh, uh, we have candidates, but but we compromise, right? And, and I think that's I think that's indicated in the previous poll, you know, indicating that uh, getting the right talent is challenging, and, and you know, going through a lot of resumes and spending a lot of time behind the wrong people is uh, frustrating for everybody. Um, again, we talked about the over overemphasis on technical qualifications. That's the price of admission. You know, if, if somebody can't do I, I've never gotten a call, never gotten a call to say, take Jim back. He doesn't know how to write a charter. I did get a call that said, uh, uh, I won't say his real first name, but let's say Joe. Uh, makes my HR manager cry every time he's in a meeting with her. How many times has this happened? Well, three times. Okay, I, I didn't get the call after the first time. Uh, we should have known about it. We probably should have been more on top of it. but. The bottom line is strong technical qualifications, uh, Gibson Gall, non-existent. Uh, the drop and run approach, um, you know, how do we support these folks? You know, how, how, do you, how do you put a PM out there and make sure a PM is being successful? We'll talk about that a little bit, right? So um, talk about, the, you know, what's the upside of a boutique uh, project management staffing company uh, and, and uh, talk about us just for a little bit, eat, sleep, and drink project management. You know, and, that, and that comes with some benefits, right? Some of those benefits, for example, uh, would be that we can um, attract folks that want to work with other project management geeks, who want to have a boss that is a published author that, uh, that, that can teach them something, right? That's got something to offer. Uh, you know, uh, we've got a, a practice director who's who's uh, been highly successful uh, building project management offices and running large projects, and uh, you know it's it's that it's that attraction, it's that what they call accretion disk, right? It's accretive, it, it's it's attractive. Uh, submitting only bullseye candidates, right? So uh, we're picky, so you don't have so so that you can uh, save your time, right? So how how do you how do you get somebody standing in the center of that bullseye or as close to it as as realistically can happen? Um, a rigorous internal re uh, review process. Uh, by the time I get somebody, or by the time Jim gets somebody, it's actually, frankly, somewhat rare that we don't send these folks forward because we have a strong screening process. But we do get to, to, to be, the, be the final arbiter. Uh, sometimes we've got great candidates, but they're mismatched. Right? Let's keep them in the database, but let's not send them forward for this particular opportunity. I had one of those today, actually. Um, soft skills. So yeah, we talked about that, right? The leadership, the negotiation. Dating to the Gibson Gill, the high the Gibson Gall, the high uh, EQ. We hear a lot of this, especially in IT and even in scientific fields for the uh, life sciences. The emotional quotient is low for technical folks, and so to take somebody who's been in the technical ranks and say because you've been a great developer or a great DBA, we're going to make you a project manager, uh, just doesn't work for me. You know, I've, I've done uh, a lot of speaking at PMI dinners, and um, here, here, how's this for an oxymoron? Introverted project manager, you know, and I've seen it, you know, and it, it's it's just um, it, it scares me, you know, that that uh, and I feel bad for the folks in the role, you know, if if, if you're not if you if you'd rather sit behind a, a computer screen and, and bang out code, 
Um, maybe you weren't meant to be a project manager. Community of practice. Uh, we've got uh, uh, peers, we've got content, we've got folks that um, uh, can help our project managers, and, and that's important. We'll talk about that a little bit more in this next slide here in terms of support, right? So, so we see when you talk about uh, going in, you know, to an organization with culture, or what is the culture, our ongoing support, um, for example, is we have a leadership team that um, we do understand leadership. We do understand predictable points of resistance. We do understand um, that you may have an environment that helps my project manager fail. Right? And so sometimes we tell you very tactfully that your baby's ugly. And what's your baby? It's your environment for your project managers, right? It's the, it's the culture, it's the lack of support, it's the inability for project managers to succeed. And so how do we, how do we proactively you know, sense a problem before you see it? How do we become that accountable one throat to choke that if the PM's not succeeding, uh, we're going we're gonna to hopefully catch that before you do. And, and get back on track, right? So, so we've got some, uh, as I mentioned, some thought leaders that, that can help do that, consultants who can jump in at the sign of trouble. Um, we've got uh, a lot of folks we've used in the past. We've got a lot of known quantities. We've got a great referral network. We're, we're in this business, right, which, which really gives us a, a, a leg up. Uh, I can tell you if you went into my LinkedIn uh, today, and we use LinkedIn quite, quite a bit for recruiting. It's been a fantastic tool for us. They were recruiting. Um, uh, function actually that, that we use, and uh, we pay a premium for that, but it's, it's been very useful to us. Um, MPUG since we wrote our first training manual for Project 95, I think it was. Uh, and then, so our mission. So let's let, let's get to uh, giving you uh, an opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, we deliver the we deliver the future into the present, right? Organizations are are delivering their missions and visions through projects, and and, and we enable that with you know through PMO success, uh, providing the structure, definition, and execution, people, process, technology, and governance, and then. You know, the initiative, definition, selection, and execution, which is what we're talking about today. How can we provide project managers that will successfully execute a project? So that's our mission. Uh, this is just a, a high-level view of our solutions business. I'm not going to spend time on that, but when we, when we come in and actually set up a PMO or stand up project server, we use this, this three-phase uh, process. And uh, overall, this is a, a summary of our of our offerings, and uh, last but not least, bottom right side, uh, probably doesn't surprise you that we do project management staffing, in fact, and that boutique we were talking about happens to be us. Um, and uh, oh, by the way, yes, we are hiring, and we have open requirements, so if, uh, if you know somebody who uh, wants to work with us, uh, please give us a shout. Uh, Dan's uh, contact information is here. Uh, we have some parting gifts. Uh, so I mentioned uh, being a published author. I am a Microsoft Project expert. Our company, uh, Jim's an expert as well. Our company is uh, uh, well versed on this. So if you go to projectassistance.com slash webinar, uh, you can get the most popular chapter in the book, which is the reporting piece, some of the, uh, the newer features. Uh, you can get a discount on the book if you're interested. Downloads for the slide deck. Uh, we get emails saying, can I get a copy of the slide deck? Yes. We'll make it available to you. So you don't have to email us. All you have to do is give us a day or two to go to that link. And um, in, our, in our video link on our home on our, uh, our home page has uh, all of our previous webinars, has some hotel, uh, how to's for videos, et cetera. Uh, our next webinar on March 23rd will be delivering the future today, okay, how achieving the organizational mission and vision through Enterprise Project Management Office Strategy and Execution. That's something we do for a living, and we'd like to share that with you. Okay, so let's see. We have a full two minutes for questions, and I'll turn it over to my moderator, Daniel. Thank you, Gus and Jim. That was all very informative. Uh, we, 
as we covered earlier, you can use the console to to ask a question. We'll give you some answers. We already have a few rolling in. Um, what sort of turnaround should be expected on a requirement from a boutique staffing firm? Want to take that one, Jim? Sure. Uh, I hate to give a consultant answer, but it, it, it will vary. <laughs> it will vary depending on the requirement. So if if it's something that's fairly mainstream, uh, it's not you know super unique. I would say one to two days. We have inventory. We have inventory. Uh, if it's something that's you know either extreme in terms of the competency skills required or just something super unique, you know it may take us several days uh, to uh, to get back. But uh, I would say in that range, you know, one to two days for something pretty typical. And up to a week for something that's uh, unique. Thanks, Jim. And uh, what, what sort of geography do you, is your you say inventory in? Where do we have our folks? Well, we, so so we have the luxury of being in the Philadelphia suburb, which puts us a hundred miles of uh, I, I guess what is it? Thirty-five percent of the gross national product is done within uh, two hours of here. So. That's right. So our sites are primarily in Washington, the New York world. We'll go into Boston. We'll go into geographies where um, companies have a presence in, in our geography. But we are primarily in the Northeast. Uh, certainly staffing our, our, our consultancy goes national uh, around our, our PPM solutions business. But from a staffing standpoint, uh, we're most effective when we can draw on that on that uh, local talent that we've used in the past that we know is, is, a, is a known commodity. Any other questions, Dan? Uh, that's all the questions we have at the time. You can uh, send further questions to uh, D Chicala, D C I C A L A at projectassistance.com. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we hope to be speaking to you again.